that what you want? Okay. We're ready to roll anytime. Mr. Stone, if we could please, if we could start off with when, what was your first exposure to George's work? When were you first aware of George? <coughs> well, I first became aware of him in the 20s. I, uh, I ran a little paper in 1922 in my hometown when I was uh, 14 years old and, and I was very politically conscious then and uh, and I, I was very much aware of, of the problems of Italian fascism and I knew about his work uh, for the Chicago Tribune as its Rome correspondent that grew into his wonderful book uh, Sawdust Caesar it's a marvelous title, and it really, really disposed of Mussolini in one wonderful phrase, sawdust Caesar. And uh, I remember as a young reporter in Camden, New Jersey in 1926, covering a Rot Rotary Club meeting, it was a visiting professor speaking. He'd been to, been to Italy, and he was talking about the wonders of fascism and how it made the trains run on time. And I was so angry, I got up from the press table and denounced him. And, I, and when he finished, I said, why don't you tell the other side of the story about the murder of Mattiotti and Amendola and the squadristi, what they did to the labor movement. And uh, he complained to the business manager. It didn't do him any good because uh, the paper was anti-fascist. My, my boss, J. David Stern, was a good anti-fascist. So uh, even though it wasn't conventional procedure for a reporter, to denounce the speaker <laughs> came out very well. And then, um, then uh, I went up to New York in 33, and I remember when uh, George started the, in fact, I forget what year was that, what year was that? 1940. 40? Uh, and I was a subscriber to it. And, um, then I was over in Paris as correspondent for the successor paper, the uh, Compass, for about nine months in the winter of 1950-51. And George saw me over there and uh, encouraged me to, to uh, I thought the paper wouldn't last very long, come home and start a, uh, start a, a little weekly like his. And, uh, so I did, after these newspapers closed down that I'd been working for in New York, there's a whole series of papers, left of center, the PM, the uh, New York Star, and the uh, New York Daily Compass. When the last one closed, the day, uh, just before Election Day in 1952, and I couldn't get my old job back at the Nation, I'd been their Washington correspondent for quite a few years, I started the weekly, and. Uh, in 1953, and like George's paper it was four pages, and uh, and he was really the father of the alternative press. In the sense of a paper that was small enough so it could be run with independent financial means, without a lot of money, and without the necessity for backers, and um, and all those things that inhibit one's freedom. Just digress for just a moment. Um, you worked for J. David Stern. Yeah. And George evidently wrote for him during the Spanish Civil War when he was covering the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. You didn't Stern own the Post at that point? Yes, he owned the the Camden Courier Post, where, uh, which I began working when I was 15. And then I worked uh, for him on the Philadelphia Record when he bought the record. And when he bought the New York Post in December 1932, he took me to New York with him as editorial writer. And I remember George's stuff from Spain. We were the only paper in New York that was friendly to the Spanish Republic, and the pressure was very great. And the attitude of the Catholic Church in those days was very different from what it is today. Uh, Cardinal uh, Spellman was very pro-Franco. And uh, the bishops weren't talking up then for, for uh, freedom and republicanism the way they are now to their honor. 
and El Salvador and Central America generally. What effect did George's work have on your work as a journalist in those days, and through the 30s and 40s, and then ultimately on I. F. Stone's Weekly? Well, I don't know. We were we were all what um, <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt uh, stigmatized as uh, muckrake journalists. A dreadful phrase he got out of Bunyan, I believe, and that he applied to that wonderful a group of American journalists before the First World War who uh, exposed the trusts and, uh, and fought for labor unionism and are very socially conscious and many of them were, were socialists like uh, uh, William Dean Howells and uh, Henry Demarest Lloyd of the Chicago Tribune. Is that turning off? Suggested turning off the light in the next room. Next door, if that'll help. I might cut down. Well, we can turn off this here. We have to go in here. Let's just go back and do it. I can cut, to, I can cut down the light in the hall, too, if I want to. Okay, we're all set. Okay. Uh, Henry, Henry, Henry Demarest Lloyd of the Chicago Tribune, who was a wonderful writer. His book, Wealth Against Commonwealth, is unjustly forgotten. It's a brilliantly written book about the Standard Oil Trust and Upton Sinclair and uh, the old Collier's Magazine. And uh, so uh, that was the term that Roosevelt coined for them. Later, he jumped on the bandwagon of progressivism. So George and I were both products, as was my old boss, J. David Stern, of that same period. That is a newspaper man who felt a, an obligation to fight for the underprivileged and uh, against injustice and against uh, the arrogance of great wealth and concentrated economic power. The same uh, trends that gave us the antitrust laws and. Federal Trade Commission, many of the reforms of Woodrow Wilson and later of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And it was a, both a socialist and a liberal tradition, because the Socialist Party was a very powerful force in America before the First World War. It was quite a, it was, uh, its main organ, the appeal to reason, had a, a half a million circulation, which was a lot in those days. So we were products of the same the same trend, I guess it goes back to Tom Paine and the American Revolution. Were you ever a contributor to In Fact? No, George didn't have uh, very many contributors or any. Well, yeah, I didn't know if you were ever one of the, uh, I know that he ran some no. stories that were stories that were too hot for people. No, to I was an editorial writer <clears throat> on the New York Post and I had a lot of freedom and it was a good paper. True. You weren't in the situation. And it was a, the Hearst writers were. No, it wasn't true. tabloid. It was full size, mm -hmm. so uh, I had a lot of freedom. And uh, and then later I worked for Ralph Ingersoll. Who was also a wonderful man to work for and a great great editor. As was David Stern. It was a pleasure to work for them. So I wasn't on a on papers where a man would feel frustrated. Mm -hmm. And the need to contribute to to an yeah. What effect do you see of George's work and then your subsequent work with, with the Weekly on what we see in the press today and some of the freedom that we see in the press today, and some of the changes that have come <clears throat> since George's time? Well, I, th I think that uh, the George's work and to some extent, I guess, my work helped to, helped to uh, inspire a lot of the younger reporters to uh, to uh, infuse a fresh spirit and some crusading zeal back into the daily papers. See, there were a lot of crusading papers before the First World War. William Randolph Hearst started as a progressive left-wing crusader. In fact, when, when uh, he ran for governor of New York in 1906, he got red-baited on the ground that Arthur Brisbane, his communist, uh, was a socialist because Brisbane's father, Albert, 
was a Fourierist. You know, the uh, utopian socialist. And as you know, uh, the United States, especially New England, was a stronghold of utopian socialism even before Marx. So, but one thing I think that the, in fact, and the Weekly did, was to show younger people that you could scrape up a few bucks, start a paper of your own, and thumb your nose at the establishment, and still make a living and, and do your job as a journalist. I think the, the, all the uh, so-called alternative papers of the 60s really uh, owe something to the example of uh, George Seldes, and I do, and they do to both of us. Yeah, yeah, actually, I was, I was getting towards that. I don't know for that. Thank you for, for reminding um, Do you think there's a need today for, for some of what happened with In Fact and with, with the Weekly? Is there still a need for, for papers that are willing to go out there on a limb? Well, Tris Coffin here in Washington runs a, a, a weekly newsletter like mine and George's called The American Spectator. And uh, he's from up in New England. He does a very good job. Very much the same way with he and his wife, and it's like George and his wife, and my wife and I uh, doing it out of their house. And uh, there, are, there's, there should be room for lots of different opinions. There, there are too few papers nowadays. It's so expensive to run a, a big daily. When I first went to New York, in uh, December 32, there were quite a few more papers than, than now, and even more earlier. Every city had five, six daily papers. Philadelphia did, Chicago did. Now it's down to one or two in most cities, and a lot of places just one. And I don't think that's good enough. I agree. And the papers, the cities that do have more than one paper are often conglomerates where the, both papers are owned by the same yeah. people anyway. And uh, some of those conglomerates uh, are pretty bloodless and they really run like businesses. Others like the Ritter, the Ritter chain is pretty good. And uh, there's still some good papers around like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times and the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal runs a lot of the kind of stories that George and I used to take up. The editorial page is very reactionary and quirky, but the news columns, are, uh, the, the reporters really dig, and they come up with a lot of socially conscious stories, and they give a lot of, uh, magnanimously give a lot of uh, freedom to people left of center. On the op-ed page, they have Arthur Schlesinger and uh, Hotting Carter and Alex uh, Alexander Coburn. And, uh, but the average small town, small city paper is, in this country is not very good because they, uh, just from one simple point of view, I'm not complaining about their policies, they don't have enough news in them. If you're traveling around the country and you get away from a couple of big cities, you don't know what's going on. The local papers don't run very much. They get the AP or UPI file, but they don't use very much of it. So uh, out in the country, there's, there's uh, room for alternative small papers. Of course, a lot of people buy the, uh, the Newsweeklies, Time and Newsweek. But on the whole, they're pretty establishment and pretty conventional and, and rehash mostly what's in the daily papers. Although Newsweek uh, has had a couple of uh, real pieces of journalism, one on Latin America recently. Most of the stuff is uh, very well written, but it doesn't, really, it doesn't add much to your knowledge if you read a couple of big city papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post every day. Excuse me. Bob? Yeah. Leave me on the, uh, on the okay, I'm sorry. Just blank on that. Um, sure. Uh, we saw a tape of uh, the, unfortunately, the tape was atrocious. Can you hear? Well, yeah. uh, of your introduction 
to George at the Polk Awards. Um, and you said that what you wanted to do was to take some of your time, and you thought that George would agree, in, and, and spend that time talking about what's going on in El Salvador. Oh, yes, because I said that, I said George were publishing his paper, that's what he'd be focusing on. What, what was happening? I, I can't remember exactly when that was, so I don't know. Were you focusing on what was going on there or the fact that no one else was talking about it? Oh, no, there was a lot of coverage in the papers. There was a, lot, was a good deal of coverage in the papers, but there was room for more. What kinds of things would you have expected George to cover had he been dealing with, in fact, at the time? Well, he'd cover the, uh, the, the killing of those poor nuns and the American land reformers and uh, the inability to get the uh, El Salvador courts to act and the, uh, the way the American government was playing up to these murderers while talking about human rights. I mean, we've, uh, we've always pursued an imperialistic policy in Latin America, supporting the great landowners against the uh, peasants, the common people. And our power, uh, American power, almost uh, unbeknownst to most Americans, who know very little about it, but our power in Latin America has really rested on a triad of the, the landowner, the general, and the priest. And the priests have defected to the honor of the church, to the side of the peasant, and a lot of the generals are younger people out of the middle class who are nationalistic and reformist in some of the countries. So things have changed a lot there. From the days when General Smudley Butler of the Marines uh, complained that he was tired of uh, having to go down there and act as an errand boy and, uh, and bill collector for Wall Street. I think we lost our power at a fortuitous moment. Well, uh, maybe if you turn the light out in the hall. Do you need that hall light? No, I, th I think we're, actually, I think we're, yeah, I, I think I we're all set. Questions. Yeah, I think, I think we're, we've covered basically what we wanted oh. to cover oh. in the interview. The light is all right. All right. Uh, here we go again. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything there. Why don't you let it run just a little bit? Sure. I'm going to go one more, one more question. Are we running? Yeah. yeah. Should I give it another five, five seconds or so? No, it's fine. Okay. Um, just as a, as a wrap, and this is a general question, um, what kind of national stories, particularly with, with what's going on in the government today, um, if in fact, or if the weekly were, were running today, uh, as a journalist even, living up in Vermont, I sometimes don't think that the national press is doing their job in their coverage of Washington. Uh, do you think that the coverage would be any different from, uh, from an alternative standpoint of, 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 of what, in fact, in the weekly world people would accomplish? Well, I think the Washington Post uh, and the Times do a pretty good job of covering Washington. Mm -hmm. But there's always more to be learned. Uh, people don't read, the, a lot of the critics of the newspapers don't read the papers. If you don't read them, you don't know what's in them. And a lot of kids, I talk to kids at journalism schools, they don't read newspapers. I don't know how they expect to become a journalist. But uh, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, Reagan has really gotten away with murder with the supply side economics and the, uh, the huge and insane uh, military program which has brought a lot of protests from inside the military services themselves. I gave a talk at the, at the press club, my one talk, in many, many years, because I was out of there for many, many years, and they asked me to come back. We had a kind of a reconciliation uh, thing. Uh, this was last spring. See, last week, no, I guess it was spring before last. Spring before last, and I said that uh, that if, uh, if Reagan would suspend his tax cuts for three years and suspend his increases in the military budget over the increases already made by Carter for three years, 
that he would have a $40 billion surplus by his own figures in, 40, in 83, and a surplus of that size in, uh, in the United States would uh, lower the interest rate all over the world, stop the outflow of capital from Western Europe, revive business in, in, in Western Europe and in the world, and revive uh, independent business here in America. That's not very radical. It's really, uh, uh, really uh, a genuine conservatism instead of the kind of kooky economics that, uh, that Reagan used to, uh, to excuse a real ripoff for the super wealthy. I mean, in a time of inflation, there has to be, uh, there has to be uh, austerity, and no society on the planet has been able to escape that. And that austerity means sacrifice. But to, uh, to put all the sacrifices on the poor, the blacks, and the elderly, and uh, hand out enormous uh, tax benefits to super rich just didn't make any sense, either from the standpoint of social equity or from the standpoint of, of sound conservative fiscal policy. But nobody paid attention to it. It was just treated as a cute event. You know, Izzy Stone back at the press club, a lot of cute stories. But, but what I had to say was, uh, was what a lot of people are saying now. But, <clears throat> too late to do it. See, 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 journalism is not a business, and it shouldn't be run as a business, as just a way of making money. It's a profession, and it's a calling, and it's a major part of a free society, and that's what Jefferson intended to be. And, and the value of these alternative papers is that despite the power of great wealth and despite the enormous cost of running a modern newspaper, it's still possible, if you have the nerve, to, to have a little paper and speak your mind and uh, reach, reach a part of the public and have an effect on the rest of the profession. And that's all of the good. And I think that Jefferson would have liked that development and would have approved of it. I think in this respect, George is very much in the best American tradition. What did you think of the Polk Award coming so late in his life? Well, the establishment never gets around to uh, honoring a, a maverick until uh, he's practically posthumous and they think it's safe to pat him on the head. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, I, the term I like is, is one a friend of mine has come up with for, for the attention that's suddenly been given George in his 91st and 92nd years, that he, he's, he's one of the few men who have who uh, managed to live long enough to receive posthumous attention while he was still alive. Posthumous what? Posthumous attention while he was still alive. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. That's about it. I think I'm all set. Are you? Okay. Um, Got a question? I had a question. I lost it. <laughs> um, but it wasn't, it wasn't time. Okay. You know what? If, if we could, just one last thing. If we could um, ask you to maybe give us a, a one quick, maybe, or even 15, uh, whatever, you know, a, a very short recap uh, about what's your opinion of George's work, you know, instead of just specifics, just in general, an opinion of his work. Well, it was independent. It was radical. It got down to the roots of things. It exposed uh, big business malpractices that a lot of the big papers were afraid to touch. It was uh, anti-fascist and uh, upheld civil liberties. Those are all very valuable contributions. Thank you. Wonderful. Can we just uh, stop for a second and play it back so we make sure we have it? Sure. All right. Let me turn off this light over here. I yeah. believe that's... Is this okay, bothering you your cataract so No, no, it isn't. I, I must say that the, 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 the cameraman handled this very well because it doesn't hurt my eyes. There we go. They're just going to check it for a moment. All right. Be all set.